So it's really a very great pleasure to be here today. Um, I am seeing a lot of wonderful, friendly faces and some new faces. Uh, thank you for coming and for having me here. Um, as Martin said, he told you a little bit about my background. Uh, some of my main research interests are looking at inequalities in the education of youth and also the quality of education received by youth in large developing countries. And by youth, I mean I mostly focus on post-primary education. And the research topic that I'm going to share with you today, uh, I think fits nicely within that uh, set of research interests. It's about the role of vocational schooling in human capital development in developing countries. Uh, and it's presenting some of the work I've done on this topic in China. Um, so a critical question, I'd just like to start out with this point, a critical question that policymakers in developing countries face is how to effectively build human capital for social and economic development. Um, as probably most of us know, that as developing economies advance, they often have to move from lower value added to higher value added industries and services, and their need for human capital increases. Um, there's been literature that's talked about the fact that jobs in higher value added industries uh, frequently require employees with skills gained at the level of high school or higher. And there's a concern, again, in you know, the economics literature that says if developing economies fail to find such a skilled labor force, their economies could ultimately stagnate. And what I'd like to point out is that a major decision that policymakers face when they try to build human capital is to think about how to balance uh, enrollments in vocational versus academic schooling. And it's interesting to note that in the literature there is an evolving discourse about the role of vocational education and training, or what I call VET, um, in development. Um, more traditionally, you may have heard arguments that say that VET is this means of providing specific, uh, occupation-specific or practical skills uh, that help to deal with problems of short-term unemployability, uh, to reduce mismatches between education and jobs, or to try to act as sort of a safety net for kids that don't do well in the academic track. Um, but more recently, I would say that the literature has talked uh, even more about the fact that DET may have a role in a longer-term strategy for development in terms of providing students with academic and vocational skills. Uh, this may be in a, more in alignment with what's been happening in countries like Germany for quite some time. Um, so I'd like to say, although there's been this evolving discourse and the purpose of VET is not always clear, I think what is clear is that there's a resurgence of interest among policymakers in developing countries, I would say especially in Asia and the Pacific, to expand VET. And as I'm going to talk about, they're doing so in a massive way. So just to give you a few examples, if you look in Indonesia over the last 10 years or so, uh, there's been a lot of movement towards trying to increase the share of VET in upper secondary education. They're trying to move from a quarter of the enrollments uh, to be VET in, in high schools to about uh, two-thirds. Uh, there's been similar efforts going on in Vietnam where enrollments have tripled. Uh, there's similar, uh, although not quite as you know, stark, changes in the enrollments in vocational schooling in Thailand and Mongolia. And although there haven't been a concrete uh, movement in this regard yet, uh, we know that the governments of India and Bangladesh have also set really firm targets for increasing uh, vocational schooling. And along with the case of China that I'm going to share with you in a minute, we can see that throughout Asia and the Pacific, there are hundreds of millions of kids that are potentially affected by this mass expansion of VET. And there are a number of studies in the past that have looked at the economic returns to vocational education uh, versus general schooling. I have to say the results are sort of all over the place. They're very mixed. Some show positive returns, some show negative returns. Um, but what I think is really shocking is that there's really not very much evidence. Uh, there's no published studies that I know of that look directly at the impacts of attending VET on skill gains. And there are very few, if any, studies which evaluate which policies seem to improve VET and lead to skill gains. And I think there's a lack of dialogue about why policymakers are so intent on pursuing VET, even if uh, it, it may or may not work. 
Um, so the purpose of my talk today is going to be to try to fill in some of these gaps in the literature. I'm first going to talk about some work I've done to assess the quality of VET, whether it's actually building skills um, in students. Uh, number two, and you can see if you're reading ahead of me that I'm going to already give away some of my punchlines. Um, I'm going to examine whether in the face of low quality, uh, policies to improve the quality of VET are working. So the third goal is to understand why policymakers are persisting, and again I'm giving away uh, some of what I'm going to show you, in promoting low quality VET, even when measures to improve quality uh, are falling short. And so I'm going to show you a big mess, in other words, um, coming up. And to fulfill these goals, I'm going to again examine the role of mass VET in one rapidly developing country, China. I'm going to basically begin with a story about human capital development, which is my first two goals. And then gradually, I'm going to discuss some of the aspects of the political economy underlying some of the decisions about VET, which is my third goal. And then I'm going to uh, offer some policy recommendations and suggestions for future research. So for the rest of my talk, I'm first going to start with a background into China and how it's doing with uh, vocational education, uh, what, what it's doing with VET. And then I'm going to talk about my three goals and then talk about uh, the policy suggestions and so forth. So to start with the fact that I think probably everybody here is familiar with, in the last 30 years or so, China's economy grew by leaps and bounds. It grew about 20 times. Uh, and much of that growth was fueled by the movement of cheap rural labor into labor-intensive industries, like construction, like manufacturing, and so on. But what's been really interesting to note over the last 10 or 15 years or so is that the supply of all this cheap labor has essentially run out, and wages in China have been increasing at a very rapid rate. Right now, China has about the sixth or seventh highest wage rate in Asia, and beneath countries like Japan and Korea and Taiwan, Singapore and Hong Kong. I think it's just about to overtake Malaysia. And so what's going to happen in the future? Well, we know China is continuing to grow at a fairly rapid pace. Um, so the demand for labor is going to grow. We know that China has passed its demographic dividends, so the supply of labor is falling short. There's less people uh, entering the labor market as there are leaving it. And according to the World Bank, this means that wages are just going to keep going up and up. By about 2030, wages could be as high as $8 per hour. It's hard to imagine. And I would like to give you just an example and talk about how these issues of constrained labor supply and these high wages are felt by the manufacturing industry in China today on a daily basis. I'm part of a very large study that looks at worker exit in Chinese factories. And this is um, data from one firm that I have been working with. Uh, there's tens of thousands of employees, and this is the weekly attrition rate. And as you can see, on average, the weekly attrition rate is 8%. So basically, within a few months, you have to replace your entire workforce. So this is some of the you know, dynamics undergoing uh, this transition in China. So these big scenes of these you know, huge assembly floors that we see in China are slowly going to become a thing of the past as companies like Samsung have decided to move their main base of manufacturing away from China into places like Vietnam. And one of the questions we might be thinking about is, well, where's my iPhone 9 going to be made? Um, and so I think with higher wages, it's very clear, at least to policymakers in China, that they're going to have to move themselves up the productivity ladder. In fact, just to bring the point home, if China continues its current rate of growth, uh, it's uh, slated to become a high-income country by as early as 2019, which I think is just crazy. It's just five years away. So um, basically, what does this mean for us in education? Expanding higher productivity industries, I, I believe, will require highly skilled labor. Uh, essentially, if an individual wants to hold a high-wage, stable job in the future, they're going to need to learn skills gained at the level of high school or higher, things like math and English and language and computers and so on. And most of this potential skilled labor, where is it going to come from in China? Well, it's going to come from rural areas. According to the 2010 census, about 75% of school-aged children, that is China's future labor force, are coming out of these rural areas. And according to a lot of the work that I've done, along with my colleagues, 
Uh, unfortunately, we find that students in rural areas are not gaining the skills they need to be ready for China's future economy. And I have a lot of examples of that, but I just want to show you what I think is probably the most troubling gap uh, in education in China between urban and students, that is the high school gap. So if you look at the percentage of students going on to high school in urban areas, it's about 80%. But if you look in rural areas, it's less than 40%. And this means that tens of millions of rural kids are essentially not getting education at the level that we would think that China needs for its future. So just to be clear, so should you know, other countries be worried that Shanghai has been at the top of the rankings you know, of the PISA for the last couple of waves? Well, not even considering the fact that the Shanghai rankings, uh, the scores may not represent what's going on in Shanghai, they really don't represent at all the underlying inequality affecting you know, China's education system as a whole. And so that leads us to ask, what's going to happen if China's rural kids are not educated? Well, for the individual, we can imagine that it means uh, lower income jobs, uh, greater chances of unemployability, and social exclusion. And then for the country as a whole, it could mean a stagnant economy, even greater inequality than China has now, and what policymakers fear most, which is social and political instability. Now, given these huge gaps, uh, what are policymakers in China trying to do to provide more educational opportunities and to build human capital? Well, in the last decade or so, last 15 years, they've really been trying to expand their high school enrollments, and the high school enrollments have essentially doubled. Um, but behind this expansion, and this is where I start talking about VT, there's been substantial tracking. Basically, policymakers have mandated that there should be a one-to-one -one ratio between vocational schooling and academic high schooling. Now, I just want to explain these tracks. I think the background is important. Basically, to get into academic high school, you, it's very competitive. You have to pass a high school entrance exam. If you pass the exam, the good thing is that you have about an 80% chance of going on to college. Um, there is high tuition in high schools, in academic high schools in China. On the other hand, um, vocational high school has no competitive entrance requirements. It has no real graduation requirements <coughs> either. Uh, only a small percentage of kids entering vocational school have chances to go on to college and there's a low subsidized uh, tuition, so it's not an issue of cost about whether one can go and stay in VET or not. Now, I'd like to say, despite the fact that VET is less competitive, if you look at the discourse among policymakers, they still do emphasize the promotion of VET as an important strategy for economic growth. Uh, Xi Jinping, who's the leader of China, has said this, uh, simultaneously promoting vocational education and economic and social development will allow us to go from made in China to high quality manufacturing. And you see similar things being said by the vice premier in charge of education about the role of VET in a modern society. And as such, you can imagine policymakers have been spending a lot on VET. One is to expand uh, VET enrollments, the other thing is to subsidize the tuition and as well to try different efforts to improve quality. Now, for the rest of the talk, I'd like to go through my goals, and given all this money that's being spent, all this attention to VET, my first goal, again, is to see whether VET is doing well, whether it's actually skilling uh, graduates. So in this regard, under this goal, I have two studies that I'd like to share with you. The first study is to assess whether attending vocational high school relative to attending academic high school actually leads to skill gains. Um, and to look at this, I went to two provinces in China. Uh, for those of you familiar with China, this is probably very boring. Uh, but one is in the east part, which is more developed. One is in the west, uh, which is less developed. I sampled about 100 vocational high schools, about 30 non-elite academic high schools, non-elite schools because they have students of relatively comparable ability to the students in vocational schools. I sampled about 7,000 vocational students, 3,000 uh, academic high school students, and in the vocational schools I went to the most popular major computers, and I'm going to explain why I did that in a second. And, you know, to be able to do all of this data collection, you can imagine I need help. I'm really lucky to be able to work in China. 
uh, where you know there's sort of a rule that basically all college undergraduates have to graduate within four years and often in their fourth year they don't take classes so I actually have you know this is really good for me I have a lot of help um, so basically you know this team and I we were able to go in the beginning of 2010 to conduct a baseline survey in all those schools that I just talked about we gave academic and vocational exams for students that is in math and in computers uh, and we gave detailed surveys. Um, we went back in the end of the school year in May of 2011 and we did the same thing. And we also carefully measured uh, dropouts. So you might be thinking, okay, you're collecting all this data, but why do you think you could even begin to compare vocational and academic skills across these two types of schools? I just want to note that vocational high school students are mandated to study academic skills. It's part of the required curriculum. So they have to study things like math. Um, academic high schools, for their part, uh, the students there have to study computers. They have to take at least one class. Uh, it's only a couple of hours in contrast to the many hours that computer major students are taking in vocational schools. But they do actually have to take computer classes which have a similar curricular content to the ones in vocational schools. Um, but obviously just comparing student outcomes across vocational and academic schools isn't enough. I couldn't uh, randomly assign kids to vocational and academic high schools. I'm sure if Eric was there in China, he would have found a way. I couldn't do it. Um, so what I did is I used this rich baseline data uh, to do three types of analysis. One, I did simple OLS, but controlling for lots of baseline covariates, junior high school fixed effects, and so on. I also used a matching exercise uh, to really try to hone in on people that were similar on observable characteristics. And then I used an IV analysis uh, based on a regression discontinuity design to try to use the entrance exam cutoff into high school, that is into academic high, as an IV for whether or not a student had attended vocational school. I just want to show you really quickly that after the matching exercise, I did get balance on the observable characteristics. I also want to show you the idea behind the IV analysis. Basically, the probability of attending VT drops really quickly as soon as you get to this academic high school entrance exam cutoff. Um, and so I again use that to try to identify the impact of attending VT on these later outcomes. And the idea in all of this, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar, is basically to try to find twins, right? Like where one of these really cute kids ends up going to vocational high school and the other goes to academic high school and then comparing their outcomes against each other. So what were the results? So from the OLS analysis, basically I find that relative to attending academic high school, VT students dropped out more. Uh, very surprisingly, they did not improve their vocational skills, uh, even though they take so many more hours of computer class. And they learned a lot less uh, math, a lot less academic skills. Now the matching analyses were essentially the same. And the IV analyses were also very similar. Uh, the results were very similar. Um, although there was no significant effect on dropout, there was again uh, no substantial difference between VET students and academic high school students on computer scores, and their math scores of VET students were much worse. So in summary, according to this first study, attending VET relative to attending academic high school seems to decrease academic skills with no discernible impact on vocational skills. Now you might be thinking, well, maybe that's not the right comparison that we want to make. Maybe we don't want to compare academic high schools with vocational high schools. Maybe we want to compare, you know, just is it a good thing to have vocational schools or not compared to having no other option compared to not going to school. And so to look at that kind of question, I went to a third province in China called Henan. It's in central China. And um, what's interesting about it is it's a nationally designated model province for VET. Uh, central policymakers say this is where VET should really flourish and be good. And it's also home to one of the largest factories in the world. I mean, it has a lot of manufacturing. And by itself, it's a giant. It has 105 million people. It's it could be the 12th largest country in the world. Um, so it's quite a place to navigate through. Oh, and, and this is for those of you interested in Shaolin Kung Fu. You know, it's also the origin of that. So. Um, so the objective of this second study was basically to measure quality of DET along multiple dimensions. 
Um, to do this, I sampled 120 uh, VET schools from seven prefectures. I went this time to the two most popular majors, um, which comprise about 40% of all VET enrollments. And I had about 13,000 grade one and grade two students in the sample. And as you can imagine, I again had to go and find people in Henan who didn't have to go to class. I was able to find quite a few. Um, together, you know, we did our, our stuff. And basically, our, our finding, our key finding, was that the quality of vocational schooling is low along multiple dimensions. And let me go through a few of those dimensions. Basically, uh, according to our data, dropouts are very high. They're about 30% within two years. Uh, if you're wondering about what happens in academic high, it's about 7% in academic high. But even among those who stayed, 43% said they were dissatisfied with vocational education. So whether they voted with their feet and dropped out and said, I'm dissatisfied, or whether they voted with their pens on the survey that we gave them, altogether about 60% of students said they were dissatisfied with vocational education. Now, in this case, I also used IRT or vertically scaled tests to try to measure absolute gains in scores from the beginning to the end of the year. And I find that the majority of grade one and grade two students are not learning. Basically, 71% of schools showed no average improvement in vocational skills. About two thirds showed no average improvement in academic skills. And you, know, you can cut this in many different ways. If I look at the entire sample, I see that basically from the beginning to the end of the year, given a very basic test on math, kids gained 0.7 items more on a 50 item test. So, you know, that's the gain in math. In vocational skills, it was about 1.3 items more. So, really very, very little learning going on in these schools um, in terms of skills. Now, what about the expected returns to going to VET? Well, they fell from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. At the beginning of the year, students thought they would earn higher wages if they graduated from VET relative to dropping out. And among the students that stayed in the sample who hadn't dropped out, uh, they had thought by the end of the year that they would get higher wages if they dropped out rather than if they stayed in VET. So that, that's kind of shocking as well. Um, furthermore, I find that students reported that schools did not adhere to even the basic government regulations for internships. Basically, 68% reported that the content of their internship did not match that of their major. 50% said, I would not recommend my internship experience to other students. 33% said, I didn't even have a teacher or a supervisor go with me to my internship. Again, a very basic requirement of vocational schooling. Um, so that was a student perspective. What did teachers say? So we did a lot of interviews in schools um, with teachers and principals. One teacher said, do I like this school? I'm planning to leave as soon as I can. Uh, basically, a lot of them wanted to go to academic high schools. Uh, principals said things like, here's one principal. I've been a principal for 30 years now, so I don't even care if I'm fired. I can tell you that, it, that out of every dollar going to vocational high school, half of that line in somebody's pockets. And I've been to a bunch of vocational schools in different provinces, and I unfortunately have to say these responses are fairly representative. I think Susanna, I don't remember if you went with us to that vocational school. Basically, you know, Susanna saw this, you had the principal sitting there, he invited students in, you know, to just, you know, meet us, and basically he's telling everybody how bad the students are in the school, how stupid the students are, how uncontrollable with the students sitting there. It's, you know, not, not a good situation. Um, but perhaps nothing explained what was happening uh, more in terms of why kids didn't appear to be learning than when we went into classrooms and conducted classroom observations. So time and time again, what we see is kids are playing video games, they're chatting with their friends on the internet, and teachers for their part, you know, have their backs to the students or on the blackboard and are not engaging students in conversation or in the, you know, learning that's supposed to be going on. So my summary of goal number one is basically that VET is not doing much to build human capital, whether you look at quantitative or qualitative evidence. Um, and maybe you might think this isn't so surprising. I mean, after all, VET did expand fairly quickly over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and maybe it's too soon, you know, to really see what's going on.
Um, so in the next part of the analysis, what I try to do is to examine whether students are thriving under these centers of excellence in VET that the policymakers have been trying to build, or to look at if and see if they're doing well under these ideal teachers that the government is trying to raise. And so to do this, I'm going to evaluate policies to improve VET. That's my second goal. I'm going to look at two policies in particular. One is the establishment of elite VET high schools. The other is this dual certification system for teachers, which I'll explain in a second. Basically, why look at elite VET schools? Well, we just saw that the quality of VET is poor. Maybe it's an issue of resources. Maybe there's not enough inputs per student. Um, so we wanted to examine the impact of attending elite VT high schools, where per student resources are greater, versus attending a non-elite uh, VT school, which is just a typical school. Uh, and to do this, I used the Henan data that I described, that third province that I went to, and uh, propensity score matching. Now, according to our data, I just wanted to show you first that, indeed, there was a significant difference in resources per student across schools, about 50% uh, more resources uh, expenditure per student, excuse me, in elite VET schools, a lot more assets per student in VET schools, and a much lower student-teacher ratio in the elite VET schools. Now, the matching results, though, uh, you know, again, this was a strict matching exercise, uh, basically showed that there were no impacts of attending elite VET schools on any of the outcomes that we measured. And we looked at a bunch, and these are just a few of them. Whether we looked at math scores or vocational skills or any kind of non-cognitive measure that we took, whether we looked at dropout or reported poor behaviors in the classroom or expectations about school or the future, there were no differences across elite and non-elite VET schools. In summary, there seemed to be no significant differences in any student outcomes between elite and non-elite VET schools. So, okay, inputs isn't the problem. Maybe there's a way to improve the quality of teachers. Well, to improve teacher quality, policymakers ask teachers to get an industry certificate in addition to their teaching certificate. So, an industry certificate they hoped would be a teacher goes into the world of work and gets actual enterprise experience but in reality, it was very hard to do that, so what they did instead is they had teachers take training courses and then get you know, a certificate if they passed a few tests. So we wanted to see if whether, and when I say we here, I worked on this uh, paper, actually Jamie is the lead author on this paper, uh, we worked on this together, so what we were trying to do is to see whether having a teacher with a dual certification improves student vocational, score, vocational skills versus not having this certification. Uh, we used a cross-subject student fixed effects method that Tom, I think, pioneered in the back. Um, basically, we tried to look uh, at the within student variation across different computer majors and tried to use that to identify uh, impacts of this dual certification on skills. I'm going to let Jamie share all the details with you, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you the punchline. Basically, dual certification did not improve student skills maybe there was even a slight negative impact on student skills. So my summary of goal number two is that the two major policies to improve the quality of VET did not seem to be effective. So for the rest of the talk, given that the quality is poor, given that these efforts to improve quality haven't worked, I'm going to try to explore some possibilities as to why policymakers are pursuing VET. So I'm going to give a bunch of possibilities, um, and I'm going to try to see what evidence I have for them. It's not exhaustive, but I hope it stimulates our thinking and maybe some discussion later. So the first possibility is that policymakers may not know that the quality of VET is poor. Um, and maybe there's some truth in this. In fact, like I had said before, there's very little empirical work on the quality of VET in China or anywhere else. Uh, the popular media in China rarely criticizes VET. Um, but they rarely criticize very much, so I don't, you know, take that with, with that what you will. Um, and then when I shared my findings with some local policymakers and some uh, academics, I did find that they were surprised at the depth of the problem. Um, but on the other hand, uh, my colleagues in the Chinese Academy of Sciences and at other universities in China, 
We did our best to disseminate our findings in the last couple of years to the media and to policymakers. Uh, we had a number of media reports in the China Education Daily, in Caixin Magazine, which is like the time or economist of China. Um, and so we really tried to get the word out there. I think even more than that with policymakers directly, uh, my colleagues and I, we submitted a policy brief uh, from the Academy of Sciences directly to the State Council. Uh, essentially, there's this long history of how the Academy of Sciences can submit policy briefs directly to the Premier's office. Uh, the Premier is essentially the number two of China. And after submitting our policy brief, um, the Premier's office had talked to the Ministry and we got a phone call. And the Ministry of Education said very clearly and very bluntly, we know there's a problem with VET. So, um, so at least it seems, maybe you know, that's more anecdotal, but if top policymakers claim to know uh, that the quality of VAT is poor, we have to ask why would they be pursuing it in the first place. So the possibility number two I would like to share with you, so, so it seems like maybe they know. Um, maybe top policymakers believe that mass VAT is the best option available to them. So how does the logic of this argument go? Basically. Top policymakers believe it's important to expand high school in general. I mean, given China's economic growth, given that they've achieved almost universal compulsory schooling, it seems to be an important thing for them to give opportunities to the population to go to high school for political legitimacy. And other people have written about that. At the same time, I would argue that top policymakers do not want to expand academic high school. And why is this? Because like I told you before, academic high students Almost all of them go to college. Almost all of the college students end up graduating. And right now, there's a fear in China that college graduates can't find jobs. And in fact, the Ministry of Education has said as much. They said one of the most prominent short-run issues is weak employment among college grads. And even the international media, which is picking this up from the Chinese media, has a field day with this, says that, yeah, there's a big college graduate employment problem in China. Now, I would say, as an academic, that there's actually really no evidence of this at all. In fact, there's evidence to the contrary. There's evidence that college grads in China do find employment. It's not the month after they graduate, but it's within the year after they graduate. And their returns climb rather quickly. Unfortunately, this isn't the popular discourse. And the bottom line could be, I think, that top policymakers face pressure to expand high school because of political legitimacy, but they don't want to expand academic high. So what they end up doing is pressuring the local policymakers to expand VET. Now, the third possibility I'd like to share with you is that top policymakers may believe that mass VET is what industry needs now. Um, what's the argument behind this? Well, Manufacturing firms in China today may only need disciplined workers with fairly low levels of skills to work in fairly tedious jobs. And maybe policymakers are responding to this need by creating the VET system as a funnel for these types of uh, workers. Well, to understand whether this argument has any merit, I conducted another study to examine what kind of employee characteristics were important for employee performance in these types of firms. And so I was able to go to one of the largest factories in the world and survey about a thousand individuals who in the last couple of years were VET students. And I was able to survey them during the hiring process and luckily the company agreed two months later to give every single one of them a detailed employee performance evaluation along a number of dimensions. And this data allowed me to basically correlate employee performance along multiple dimensions with different characteristics I had collected at the baseline, including math skills, vocational skills, non-cognitive measures, uh, things about schooling and family history, and expectations. Now, what did I find? Um, I think the results in the beginning were a little bit surprising to me. I found that things like perseverance, uh, low job expectations, sometimes vocational skills, and sometimes being a VET graduate rather than being a dropout, those things were positively correlated with employee performance. On the other hand, and I've almost never seen this you know, in anything I've read, 
things like math skills or high educational aspirations were time and time again negatively related to employee performance on multiple measures. Um, and, but when you take a step back and you think about it, given the kinds of simple tasks that Chinese workers do when they enter these factories, maybe the results aren't all that surprising. And they underscore the possibility that local policymakers may, may be responding to the pressures they're getting from local industries. Remember these huge factories that employ so many people in their province. Now the fourth possibility I'd like to share is maybe policymakers are dissatisfied with the quality of BT. Maybe they know it's bad, they're not happy with it, they're looking for ways to improve it. And the only evidence I can give you is again from the policy discourse uh, where the Ministry of Education has said, in the long run, our biggest challenge is the contradiction between the rapid transformation of industry and the deficiency of workers with high levels of technical skill. The most important step in resolving this challenge is the creation of a modern system of vocational education. So from this quote and other quotes that I showed you earlier, I think there is this long-term sense in the policy-making dialogue in China to try to make VET something that will be there for the long run, even if it's not doing well in the short run. Now this is just to summarize the possibilities because I know I just told you a lot of things. Um, maybe policymakers don't know, maybe they know but they don't want to expand academic high school, uh, maybe they think VET is what industry needs, and maybe they're working on it. So given these possibilities, what are some policy suggestions? I'd like to take each one of these uh, fairly briefly and in turn. Number one, if policymakers don't know the quality of VET is low, obviously I think the burden is partly on us to do more research and to do more outreach. Um, I should tell you I'm very excited. We submitted a second policy brief that two days ago the State Council actually rubber stamped. They said, uh, you know, this is uh, ratified and we're having a meeting with the Ministry of Education on Monday. So I think we're doing a better job on this uh, now. Um, the second po uh, possibility, if policymakers don't want to expand academic high school, um, well, if this is really what's going on, I think I, I would say we need to do more work to try to have policymakers understand there's no evidence that college graduates can't find jobs. I think at the margin it's important to expand academic high school since kids are doing better there. Uh, rather than VET, at least for the short term. Now, if policymakers think VET is what industry needs now, I think they should recognize that VET is in fact not producing the kinds of uh, things that firms need. One, VET has a lot of dropouts, not those graduates that are doing well in firms, and VET is not improving the vocational skills that we also found were positively correlated with employee performance. I think also these firms are gradually leaving China anyway, and I think a new focus is needed for China's long-term development. Now, if policymakers know that quality is low and want to improve over time, I think they should think about new ways to try to improve the quality of VET, rather than these input-based methods that they've been using so far. Now, a first step for improving the quality of VET, especially given what we saw when we went into schools, Maybe that schools need more assessment and more accountability. I realize I'm at risk of saying this in the School of Education to some degree, um, with some groups. Um, but in fact, recently the government has become very interested in this. And I have a new uh, research project underway in partnership with the Henan government uh, to introduce an outcomes-based assessment and accountability system for BET schools. Uh, basically, we were able to randomly select a group of schools that were told that if they meet quality standards, they would receive rewards from the government and they would have greater chances to cooperate with industry. Um, is this going to improve quality? Well, the first round evaluation survey is in spring of 2015. I'm looking forward to share these results with you in the future. And thank you, finally, very much for you know, being so patient and, and listening. So, thank you.